Extradition. It allows one country to transfer a person suspected of a crime to another for trial. But it can be highly controversial, with some human rights groups arguing the most recent treaty between Britain and the US is unfair. The 2003 agreement made it easier for the US Department of Justice to extradite someone from the UK to America. And one case which has drawn strong criticism is that of Saeed Talha Assad. In July 2006, he was arrested in London at the request of the US, accused of running a jihadi website. He was extradited to the US six years later in October 2012, after fighting the request through the courts. At the moment, he is expected to go to trial in the US next year. With me here in the studio is Hamja Hassan, who is the brother of Saeed Talha Hassan, also Isabella Sankey, who is policy director at Liberty. And joining us from Houston in Texas is Douglas McNabb, who works as an international criminal defense lawyer. Thank you all very much for joining us here on Impact. Hamja, if I can start with you, why do you think the extradition process is unfair? I mean, it's just so lopsided in favor of the United States. We're, we're um, you know, we're, Britain is America's friend, and it's not even interest in our friendship, even pro-American conservatives object to the extradition treaty in our country. But above all that is the human cost of extradition. Now, my brother's been detained for, without trial, for some of the longest periods in, um, with the longest periods in British history. Um, and it's just been a terrifying nightmare for all the families involved. And if there's one strong argument against the extradition treaty, it is that, that, that live in hell your life becomes well, when you, you're, you're in no Isabella, certainty. do you believe legally the treaty is unbalanced? The treaty is certainly unbalanced, but I think the biggest problem is uh, the, the, the standards that are set on both sides. We're not interested in having a balanced treaty if that means no one gets um, sufficient protection and sufficient rights protection. What we're looking for is some common sense to be put back into the treaty so that some basic procedural safeguards are there to ensure that extradition isn't arbitrary, isn't unfair, um, and that when people are accused of doing things here in the UK, for example, it's, a, it's first at least considered whether they could be prosecuted here rather than all of the trauma that Hamdra has just described. Yeah, Douglas, can we talk on that point to you? Saeed is British. What he's accused of doing is setting up a website here in the UK. Why should he have been extradited to the US? Well, the United States government takes a very, very aggressive approach extraterritorially and under a number of federal criminal statutes, if there is activity that occurs outside the US that potentially can have effects in the US, and the U.S. has uh, federal criminal jurisdiction to prosecute for those offences. My other two guests have just said that the extradition treaty is unbalanced and in favour of the U.S. What do you say to that? Well, I would certainly agree. It is uh, it is uh, unbalanced. Uh, however, uh, Mr. Hassan was able to uh, contest his extradition uh, for up to six years. Uh, I appreciate the fact that he sat in jail for six years, but he did that of his own accord because he was challenging seeking not to be extradited to the U.S. Once he landed in the U.S., he made his initial appearance in the U.S., he now has a trial date some 18 months uh, away. Uh, 18 months sitting in jail waiting for trial, but that's of his own accord as well, because I reviewed the docket sheet, which is a list of everything that takes place in court, uh, and uh, Mr. Hassan has, on his own, waived uh, his right to, to, to a speedy trial. Uh, he needs time, frankly, in order to prepare for this trial. This has been designated a complex case. But he's sitting in jail, whether it was in UK or in, um, in the US, uh, because uh, that's what he wanted to do in order to contest the extradition. Hamja, he's sitting in jail in the US, we should mention, in isolation on his own. I mean, what has all of this done to you and to your family? Yeah, it's just been a terrifying nightmare. As I said, um, over 50% of suicides occur um, in um, in solitary confinement in the United States. That's according to their own statistics. Um, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture, you know, wants to abolish this type of um, extreme isolation in um, American prisons, which is, um, you know, what is used in, um, you know, Guantanamo and um, Bradley Manning subjected to and so forth. And that causes irreversible mental damage, you know, putting someone in pretrial isolation for such a long period of time. Douglas, why is he being held in isolation? Well, I suspect it's because of the uh, allegations uh, involving terrorism. It may be to, uh, from the U.S. Marshall standpoint, to protect him so that uh, he isn't put in general population and therefore risk uh, having uh, being injured by one of the uh, one of his inmates, uh, co-inmates. 
Also, I would suspect it's because of the allegations uh, in involving some of which involving classified information information they may not want him to mix with the uh, with the general population but Douglas are terror defendants treated differently uh, I think they are uh, if uh, Mr. Assange were charged with very very serious uh, kingpin drug trafficking charges I don't see that they would put him in a solitary confinement uh, I think it's because of the allegations itself uh, is, is why he is where he is right now Isabella, exactly what would you like to see changed in terms of the extradition law? There are several things that must change with our extradition law. And, and an important point to make is it's not just in relation to the US. We have extradition arrangements with countries all over the world with even poorer human rights standards than, than the US and the US criminal justice system. So this is something that needs to apply across the board. We say that before anyone goes anywhere, a basic case needs to be made in a British court that they have a case to answer. That's not currently required under our extradition act. We also say uh, that when the activity alleged is supposed to have taken place in whole or in substantial part here in the UK, a judge should be able to bar extradition in favour of a prosecution brought here in the UK. And that's a test that's not properly um, on our statute book either. So at the very bare minimum, these two things need to happen. One very worrying development over the last few weeks is that the Home Secretary, in a bill going through Parliament right now, is currently trying to withdraw the right of automatic appeal for people who are uh, subject to extradition orders. So that that's something that we think needs to be stopped. We did actually contact the British Home Office on this case. They didn't agree to appear, but we do have a statement from them that we should bring you. And it says uh, this, we have effective, fair and balanced extradition arrangements with the US and other international partners. Extradition is an important way of ensuring that serious crimes are prosecuted in the most effective way so that criminals do not walk free and victims receive justice. When you hear that, Hamza, it doesn't seem like there is any mood there to, to change the law in any way at all. Um, and, you know, when the Conservative Party were in opposition, they were the very first, I mean, including all the high-ranking members, to oppose the extradition arrangements, at least in word. And, you know, extradition is for fugitives if someone runs away. My brother's been ripped from his family home, from a country he's never set foot on, and then been put into the same type of prison regime as, like, a death row inmate in a supermax prison. It's, you know, it's absolutely absurd. All these basic things like presumption of innocence before proven guilty, habeas corpus, um, protection from torture, access to family, they've all been turned on their head and, it, and they're the most elementary basic civil rights. Okay, Hamza, Isabella, Dallas, McNabb, thank you very much, all of you, for joining us here on Impact. Now, like many countries in Southeast Europe, Serbia has a long, 